Are you a leader, manager, entrepreneur, business owner, or knowledge worker? Are you leading people or wondering how to be a better leader in your own life and work? If you are, then you can be experimenting better. Welcome to The Experimental Leader, a podcast that takes a look at the ways leaders are experimenting in their own work. Hosted by Melanie Parrish, we dive into real-life conversations about how people might be using a scientist's mindset and experimenting in their work. Shift your leadership into something that works better. Join us on The Experimental Leader today. Hi, everybody. I'm Melanie Parrish. It is so amazing to be with you on The Experimental Leader podcast today. It's great to be live. I love the wild ride of being live with you. Um, And December and then into January in my world is just this really interesting time um, where I start to do wrap-ups with my clients about the year. I start to look forward into next year, which always has a sort of interesting... um, this this, uh, added effect where I start to do the same for my own life. So I start to think, oh, well, you know, what was a part of this year for me and what do I want to have happen next year? So I'm super curious for you, you know, what are you proud of that you did this year? And, you know, what are your top three things that you're proud of that you did this year? And then what do you want to have happen next year? And I don't really just want you to answer like, what do you want to do next year? Cause like, that's a thing and you can do a lot, but like, how do you want it to feel? How do you want it to feel different? How do you want it to like, what do you want to call forth out of yourself? What do you want to call forth out of the world, the universe, your relationships? How do you want to show up differently? Um, I know this year, one of the things I was really proud of is I, I I got a little bored and I realized um, I wanted my friendships to be deeper. So I just started um, calling myself out to have more uh, deep conversations in my life. And and I think I did okay at that. I, as I'm leaving the end of the year here, I'm like, huh, yeah, they got better when I started um, being a more active participant in my own life. And uh, I also know that I want more hot springs in 2023. Uh, I like, I've realized that I don't have to wait till hot springs appear. I can travel for them. So I'm pretty excited about that. And I'm also committing to 150 days of, well, I want it to be swimming, but I can't commit to always being able to swim when I travel. So I'm going to say 150 days of exercise. So what are you calling forth for your life uh, in 2023, not so much New Year's resolutions, just what do you want to order up? Like if you were in a restaurant and the restaurant, you could just order up 2023 to be what you wanted, what would you order up? And today I am super excited about our guest. Um, Her name is Amy Eliza Wong, and she's the founder of Always On Purpose, She's a founder, an author, a speaker, and a leadership coach. She's also a mom to two kids, a wife, and a busy entrepreneur. She's based in the California Bay Area. And her best-selling new book, Living on Purpose, was released in May 2022. I'm super excited to have you on my show. Ah, Thanks, Melanie. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, um. We are doing book club on my show this year, which is always a little awkward right now, but um, I, I released my book in April of 2020, like pandemic. And so this year it was just a weird time to release a book. And so um, I've asked all my guests this year to sort of read a chapter. And this week, this, this month, we're reading chapter three, how to conduct an experiment. And I always think this chapter is really funny because when I was writing the book, people were always like, well, you know, it's, it's about the experimental leader. So the experiment must be the most important part. And I don't actually think it is. I think the idea of experimenting is way more important. Um, But I wanted to read just a little bit from the book and then we're going to talk about it. 
Experimentation, on the other hand, identifies an end state, but has few opinions about exactly how that condition will be reached. Experimentation thinks about the coulds and maybes and possibilities and encourages people throughout the organization to see what they can contribute toward reaching that end state. Experimentation is dynamic and flexible and fosters the kinds of skills needed for a fast paced, ever changing environment. So I know you read this chapter. I'd love to hear like what came up for you. I know you work a lot around, you know, innovative companies and uh, people who are doing fast paced, innovative things. What what did you notice for you and where it intersects with what you do? Yeah, well, it, it couldn't resonate more with everything that I, I stand for, everything I do, everything I focus on. And what you just read, I think, was so beautifully articulated in what, what it really means to experiment. You know, I have a, I have a saying, and I, I, I use it often, which is I'm always choosing momentum over certainty because that's the creative process and what you just described really is that it is the true creative process it's to it's 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 almost an art and a science right and 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 how we effectively create in the world in a way that's open and generative and nourishing versus stifled and constricted and 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 you know it doesn't feel great but what you described here is really the art of being able to say okay here's my north star it's what I'm shooting for and now let's go for it and let's iterate as we go and as we iterate, it's this idea that I'm, I'm, I've got a North Star, but I'm not so attached to it that it can't shift. So as we get the data in, 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 the, sh in the kind of the short term, we might adjust and, and shift that North Star. So I think, you know, that right there, it's, it's what you described is a perfect, perfect description of what the real nourishing creative process is. Well, and, and I don't know if you noticed this in coaching, but I've thought for a long time, like people come to me and they hire me because they mostly want something to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like people don't come to hire me to maintain their status quo usually. <laughs> no. <laughs> and so, so something, they want something to happen. Yeah. And they're pretty sure they want it to happen really fast. And, um, and sometimes it does. Um, I have a client like that right now where things are happening really fast. And I'm like, whoa, this is happening really fast. Because <laughs> I'm, I also sort of have noticed over the years that sometimes the things happen, but the timeline isn't always as clear. Like you can, you might be able to order it up from the universe and work toward it or have it happen. But sometimes you have to be patient or systematic or, you know, it, it isn't always the timeline you think you want. Mm -hmm. And um and so it's, I just think that's so interesting. You know, it, it's like, there's, there's, um, you can, you can have some certainty about what you want to have happen. And then are you willing to do what it takes to make that happen? And um, I don't know, I love the uncertainty piece too. Yeah. And, and time, the time is often the uncertainty piece, like how long yeah. will it be? Oh, Yeah. And, you know, I mean, what you're speaking about is just such wisdom. It's We have this idea that we can predict what's going to happen. But I don't know where this comes from. Because like, we can never predict what's going to happen. You know, I, and I, I often reflect with clients. I'll say, okay, just, just take a look at your life right now. Go, now go back five years. Now, did you think five years ago that you'd be here doing this? And I was like, oh, not really. And so it's, you know, it's when we can uncouple and detangle ourselves from this idea that we're supposed to predict, we're supposed to accurately predict what's going to happen. You know, the more we can detangle this idea, it's the more free we are to create, ideate, and to, to live into possibilities that are, that, that are really nourishing. And that's, I think that's the magic of really being on purpose and living on purpose. It's being, being open to possibility, but you can't, you can't be open to possibility when you're so, Mm, rigidly following an idea of what you think you should be doing or what you think you actually want. I have a question for you because you, I, I sort of just, am, I'm sort of working on the assumption, you know, reading your bio and stuff that you work with people who are similar to, to the people that I work with that are highly successful, that are working in highly successful companies. And, um, and I, I keep having this thought and it's not a very well thought out thought just so in case anybody thought I planned this conversation, I didn't, but um, I keep having this like thought about when people are like, get frustrated in leadership 
And I'm, and I'm like, what's like, I keep thinking like, what's that about? I don't think it's very useful. I don't think frustration is particularly useful. I think it takes up a lot of energy. I, I think it often is around control, but I'm just wondering if you want to weigh into that, like what you see, what you've thought, um, anything you want to add, because I know you work around sort of fulfillment thoughts and, you know, living on purpose, this idea of, I just wonder if you have any weigh in on, on frustration. Yeah. I mean, gosh, we could probably spend all day on this topic and, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's really a broad, a broad question here. And so my, my first instinct is to like really dig into that. And it's like, well, what is it about the frustration that's interesting here? And what is it that is worth focusing on? And yeah, I mean, as humans, I mean, regardless if you're a leader or not, we get frustrated. That's just, that's just true. That's a very human experience. And, you know, if we, if we narrow the conversation to frustration and leadership, I mean, do I, do I feel that? Oh yeah. I mean, frustration, it's, it's essentially, it's a resistance to what is. So we've got a reality and then we push against it. The moment we push against it, that's frustration. And so, you know, depending upon what, you know, my client's real goals are, um, it's really going to depend, the conversation is, is going to be shaped by what those real goals are. Now, in truth, Melanie, and maybe you maybe this is true for you too, but you know, when you take a big step back, when it comes down for everybody, at the end of the day, they just want to feel good. They want to feel free. They want to have inner peace. They want to feel, they want to feel good. They want to feel better than they do now. And I loved how you kicked off our talk here today asking about next year. And it was such a powerful question that not many people think to ask, but how do you want to feel in 2023? Mm -hmm. And that's so powerful because you know, what we tend to forget as humans, particularly as ambitious and very professional, you know, well, we, we got to achieve and we got so much to do. What we forget is that everything that we want, everything we think we want, it's actually not for the thing or the money or the status. It's because we think it's going to make us feel a certain way. And so if we're contending with frustration, that's generally going to be feeling we don't want. And where I generally take that conversation or where it tends to unfold in a conversation is recognizing that we're placing our power and our happiness in the conditions around us, thinking that if I can just move the pieces around in a certain way, I'll be free, I'll be happy, I'll be effective, I'll be you name it. And so really the opportunity, there's a there's usually a possibility or opportunity. It's like, well, what would it be like to be unconditional in your leadership, to be, to be able to be with what is and not resist it, but to be able to work with it? Because frustration generally isn't a productive emotion. It's just eating up resources, keeping us from being creative. I, I agree with you. And uh, something that you said about that feeling question made me realize that setting an intention about how you want to feel in the future really is setting a target condition. Um, and so you can work toward it without a clear plan. So it gives you that flexibility um, to work toward a target condition in a variety of ways without knowing how you're going to get there, but to hold the feeling of something as a target condition is a really interesting, sorry, it makes my little, you know, <laughs> experiment like target condition brain really happy to, yeah. to think yeah. that we have feelings in there as the target condition. Oh, I, I love that. I mean, because, you know, it's oftentimes, you know, unless you actually bring that in, if you don't, many of us work against ourselves. You know, at the end of the day, many of us, I mean, I can't imagine any human out there that doesn't want to feel free and to feel good and to feel inner peace and to feel love and all of those things. And, you know, so we all want that, but if we don't bring it into focus and we're not using that as our target condition, we go forth thinking it's in the thing, but it's oftentimes we're ch chasing the thing that forsakes the feeling. It's like, well, if I just get this promotion and if I just do this and if I just do this and I just do this and it's and, and then we find ourselves with completely um, wonky work life balances where we have, you know, we're stretched. We've got this or that. And, and we're so far from this feeling of inner peace. And so until we actually bring that into the equation, like what is it you want to feel? Often we can be working against ourselves, adding to more frustration. Well, and, and I often use joy as a barometer because I, mm. if I'm exhausted, I can't get easily to joy mm -hmm. and I can't sustain it. And right. so 
I don't have to worry so much about work-life balance because if I'm wiped out, I'm not going to feel the joy. So it's a good, it's a good measurement. It, it's like a, on it keeps me honest. Yeah. If I'm, if I, you know, if I can't get to joy, I better, I better clean something up. <laughs> it's uh yeah. It's, uh, although I had a little period in my life this year where I, I had a really hard time getting there. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, wow, there's a lot of work to do to figure out what's, what's keeping me from that. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I, it took finding a hot spring in New Mexico with a friend. And I was like, oh, there's the magic equation. I just have to <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, I, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, Joy. I mean, it's, it truly, it is, I think it's the ultimate. It's the ultimate North Star because, I mean, it's, it is, uh, it's just so life-giving. It's so life-giving. And um, it's when we're in that state of joy, that's when we're able to really, truly innovate and create and connect with others and navigate powerfully. And it just, there's so much goodness comes from that state of joy. And boy, do I hear you though. Like, I think it's just, it's, it's just the creative process. It's the human process to go through these cycles. I mean, we all live in seasons and there's the, there's, you know, there's the up season and then there's the down season as there's birth and then there's death and there's, you know, so it's, it's this, it's this idea that we can be in joy all the time, I think is unreasonable. And when we find ourselves in those states when we're not, it's just recognizing that, oh, this is just the cultivation period. This is the winter, this is the winter season of my creativity. And so when we can be in those down states and not push against them, but just to honor it for that cultivation and the fertilization of what's coming, I think can be really helpful. But but boy, do I hear you, Melanie. I was there too. Whew, boy, was I there near the end of this year. And I, I had to, my husband and I went off to and did a phenomenal retreat in Sedona. Oh my gosh. And there I found my spring of joy again. <laughs> so I hear you. It's like, it's like um, when you lose it and then you find it, mm-hmm. it's like such a gift if you, because I, I hadn't, I hadn't, I don't know. It's, it's so interesting that uh, ebb and flow of that. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it is kind of a superpower to find, to be able to reliably find it time and time again as a coach for me, that I can find that and hold that for myself so that I can help clients look for it. Um, Maybe that's the real heart of what I do as a coach is just like perpetual hunting for joy. (laughs) <laughs> I love that a tagline perpetual hunter of joy <laughs> I know but I think it's not it like ultimately awesome. like kind of it I think some people we never get there but yeah. you know we're always looking yeah. and it, it is interesting so I want to know why you decided I know what it takes to write a book mm. living on purpose yeah. Why was that the yeah. book you wrote? Yeah. Well, it's, I, you know, I have been devoted to such at an early, early age. I mean, I'm just so fascinated with all things about the human condition, consciousness, existence, transcendence. I mean, really young. I, I've, I've shared with folks that I found Thich Nhat Hanh in fifth grade and started meditating really young. And I just, I've been so dedicated to this, the bigger questions about, us and like what does it mean to truly thrive and um as you know I I happened into coaching coaching really found me in 2010 and I it's just I I am so fortunate I I really truly feel like I live a miracle every day truly in my calling and when I when I went off on this path and began working with folks after you know so many hundreds of conversations and after my own research and my own self-study, I was be- it was becoming very, very clear that there are some pretty universal ways in which we hold ourselves back. We don't really realize it. And it has to do with how, how we um, relate to ourselves and the re- how we relate to the world. And in the process of working with so many clients, I kind of was stumbling upon um, a somewhat of a nonlinear process to take people through to, to really free themselves from false perception, free themselves from this conditional mindset of, oh, I just need to get this and this and this and this, what I call the, the hamster wheel that we're on. It's like, oh, if I just finally get that final set of proof, I'll finally be free, which everybody tends to be on. It's like, how do we free ourselves from that? And so in doing this work, it was around 20, oh, what is it? it was 2016 or 2015. I knew exactly what this book needed to be. But I also knew I wasn't ready to write it because I was still in the process of all the client stories and all the research. And 
the kicker and and I and and truly the motive behind this really was coming from a lot of my clients saying, "Is there a book on what we're doing? Like, where how can, where can I go read more?" And I'm like, "It doesn't exist yet." And so the the ask was so regular, and I I'm like, and I the the desire, like you know, I don't want what we're doing here to be limited between me and the folks that I can actually work with, this needs to be available for everybody. And so I knew I was going to write it. And it wasn't until it was, it was in 2016 when I was in my certification for conversational intelligence, which is all about the neuroscience of trust and communication. And what does it take to be conversationally intelligent? And when I learned about the neuroscience of rejection, like the, the top blew off. That's when I knew, oh my gosh, the final, what I, the final piece of this that puts the whole thing together, I've got it. And so as soon as that solidified, it was, I, I I'm like, this is it. I, I got it. And I, but I also knew not time. And it wasn't until 2019, um, that I got the, I got the hit. And so for me, you know, I only live off of inspiration. Like if, if I does if it doesn't feel time, then I won't do it. I'm, 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 I'm very tuned into like, when does it feel this? When does it feel that? Which that hasn't always been the case for me, but in 2019, I got the hit and I'm like, okay, now is the time. And, uh, and then it was just, it almost as if it was almost effortless. <laughs> Woo! And there we go. And so that's, that's why I'm really just because I had to, I had to get this out there because it really helps people. Um, I'm totally curious about what you learned about rejection that changed everything for you. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, all of us, so taking a step back, you know, and maybe you see this with a lot of your clients, but there tend to be pretty, pretty familiar themes about the fears that we hold, right? So a lot of us tend to be afraid of failure. A lot of us tend to be afraid of, you know, disappointing others judgment, humiliation. A lot of us have a hard time public speaking. Like there are all these things that seem kind of unrelated on the outset. But when you kind of, when you take a step back and you're like, oh, this is interesting. Yeah. You know, when it comes down to it, like I'm really afraid it's a failure. And it's like, actually, sure. But what's going on here is humans, we have a wiring within us that truly, literally what rejection is as triggering as, as the threat of death. Rejection registers as physical pain. I have to think, well, how, how and why is that the case? You know, and when you look at a human, you know, when we're born, we're born survival brain dominant, right? So the prefrontal cortex isn't developed yet. So we're born hardwired to survive. We're also born in this tiny, tiny helpless shape in order to fit through the birth canal, which necessarily makes us entirely helpless and dependent on caregiver. So when you put those facts together that you're hardwired to survive and you need caregiver to survive, then naturally the brain is going to be programmed to know that, okay, life, sure, we want food, water, shelter, but hey, that ain't coming unless mom, you know, mom or dad buy in. So therefore, death to the human brain is rejection. And so that wiring exists really within us from the moment we were born to the day that we die. And that, when you think about it, it's like, whoa, that fundamental wiring really influences all aspects of our perception, how we perceive, how we navigate, because our brain is looking out for safety all the time. Environmental threats and social threats really are one and the same to the brain. And so unless we actually get, whoa, I, on a, on a primal level, I'm hardwired to avoid rejection. Without us knowing that, we can be so hard on ourselves. Like, oh, I was so, uh, gosh, I, why is it so hard for me? Like, I, I don't want this judgment. I don't want to speak in front of people. Oh, I don't want to fail. Well, it all kind of maps, it all maps back to this fear of rejection. And so bringing that into the story of how and why it is that we navigate in the way that we do can be so eye-opening for folks. Yeah. Well, and for you know those of you listening to this podcast if you are creating a brand and you remember what amy has just said this is so powerful for brands too because you know knowing that a brand will stand by you knowing that you know um as a practitioner i stand by my clients i'm sure you do too you know this this fear is so ubiquitous um i it that it underlines so much decision making. Mm. All, all, I feel like it's almost all of it. Yeah. It's, all of the decision making. When we talk about imposter syndrome, when we talk about, yep. you know, it's it lives in the minds of our top leaders. If you look yeah. at decisions that they make, often the sphere is right there. That's such an interesting 
description of it though. Mm-hmm. Um, I love that. Thank you yeah. for diving yeah, to of that. Of course, of course, of course. Yeah. And it's Howard, we can learn. what's up for you in 2023? How are you experimenting in your life and work in 2023? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I just feel so, I just, I'm, I'm, I, boy, I love the creative process. Now for me, and as I explain in Living on Purpose, you know, I think one of the most powerful ways to facilitate, to create and facilitate flow for oneself. And I love the word flow. I focus on flow. And I love that's how you kicked off chapter three in your book, which was talking about flow. To me, that feeling of flow is so powerful. And you know, what are the ways in which we can facilitate and create flow? Now, for me, it really is about following inspiration. What does not work for me is to say, okay, here's my five-year plan and here's what I'm going to create in the world. And it's like, well, I don't know if that's what I want to be doing five years from now, but I do know what I want to do three months from now. I do want to, I do know what I want to do next summer. And I only think as far as I, as it feels good. And so what currently at the moment, you know, I've, I feel so um, blessed to have been able to, to get this book out in the world and, and touch people's lives. And it feels like what's really coming is working with um, individuals in a, in a bigger way. Cause right now I work with a lot of companies and I love that. I love working with leaders. I love working with companies. Um, and there's also, you know, communities out there that, that, that I really do want to also be working with. So I feel like, you know, working with folks in a, in a, kind of in a, not hate to say B2C because that just sounds so formal, but in a more, um, it just in a bigger way feels that I feel like that's what's really ripe. And what also um, really pulled on my heartstrings and moved me in a, in a, in a direction was I focus a lot on mindfulness meditation. It's a big part of my, my own personal practice. It's a part of the coaching that I do with folks because it's such a powerful agent for real change. It's waking up that awareness muscle so that we really can be in the driver's seat. So I've decided to dive into that in a really, really powerful way. And, and so um, going on a two-year certification for mindfulness meditation teacher training to, as to just not necessarily to go teach it, but to just really fill the, the toolbox, you know, in full so that it, it really fully supports my clients and everything else. I'm, I'm doing in the world. So that that's what feels really, really nourishing. That's what I'm excited about. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. Yeah. And where can people find you, Amy? Yeah. So you find out lots more about me at my website, which is always on purpose.com. And I'm on LinkedIn, which is Amy Elisa Wong. You can easily go follow me there. And of course, if you want to check out Living on Purpose, it's available where all books are sold. Amazon's probably the greatest place to get it. The Audible's there. And I, I got to narrate, which was super fun. So if you're an audio book kind of person, then it might be a great option for you. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much for being here today. It's been really a pleasure just talking about all things Living on Purpose. Uh, it's fantastic. We'll be back right after this message. If you're trying to figure out how you can use strategic intents, operational intents, and tactical intents in your own business, take a look at my book, The Experimental Leader. Be a new kind of boss to cultivate an organization of innovators. You can get a copy of that book for $4.95 at book.experimentalleader.com. I want to get this book in your hands so that you can start having a new relationship with your own leadership. Welcome back to the show. It's been great being with you here today. And as the year comes to an end, I really want to challenge you to think about the flow in your life. Uh, I loved Amy's perspective on that. Something I talk about all the time Uh, Think about where the flow is constricted and where it's good, where the energy, the money, the light, the joy flows and where it doesn't and what the bottlenecks are and how you can remove them to restore and optimize flow in the ways that you want to in your life for 2023. It's been great being here with you today. Go experiment. Thank you for joining us on another episode of The Experimental Leader. We hope you have found value in today's episode because we are dedicated to helping you become the experimental leader you want to be. 
To access the show notes or learn more about working with Melanie, visit melanieparish.com. Go experiment.